Every so often, science has the power to blow your mind. Like when my dad told me the Earth wasn't flat. And I wondered why people didn't drop off the bottom. Or the fact that the Earth is really just a dot orbiting another dot in a vast sea of dots that make up our galaxy, which in itself is a dot. Well, the mind-blowing thing is about to happen again. I think we are really close. The latest experiments reveal nothing is as it seems. Seeing the truth will drive you extinct. And it's time for the universe to get a reboot. We're looking for the machine code of the universe. Is it possible that you found this code? That's a, that's a weighty question. So buckle up, because we're on a quest to find the next big breakthrough in our understanding of the universe. I've worked on lots of science, and I've simply never seen a case where things have gone so well. This quest isn't going to be a complete wild goose chase. To quote Boris Johnson, we will be following the science. So the reason I think there might be something big on the horizon is that history is following a pattern. And just before a massive breakthrough is made, there seems to be a certain set of circumstances. And we, well, I think it feels like we're in that exact set of circumstances right now. And to understand why, we need to go back in time. A hundred years ago, the establishment believed a planet called Vulcan was very close to the sun because they needed Vulcan's gravity to explain something weird, Mercury's exceptionally wobbly orbit. And when a maverick scientist called Albert Einstein came along and told them Vulcan didn't exist and that their whole idea about the universe, time and space was wrong, they laughed. And now, a number of scientists think the establishment is making the same mistake again. Oh yeah, hi Dr. Clark. Um, I think I'm outside. Because up there in the universe, we're seeing a lot of very weird things, which the establishment is explaining with the modern version of Planet Vulcan. You are indeed outside. Uh, how you doing, you right? Dr. Clark has written books about every major paradigm shift throughout history. If anyone can spot history repeating itself, it'll be him. Okay. The amount of weird stuff that we're seeing is growing and growing and growing. The establishment relies on the gravity from dark matter to explain the way the universe looks. But dark matter could be another Vulcan, because despite 30 years of searching, we've still not detected any. I read more and more skepticism uh, in the general community um, about this. And then even more bizarre, to explain the weird behavior of the universe at the largest scale, the establishment has been forced to call upon dark energy. You know, we call it dark energy literally to show that we don't know what it is. It just feels like there's something that we've invented, a bit like planet Vulcan. But most telling, the establishment's theory of everything, string theory, is still unproven. It's the theoretical physics version of banging your head against a brick wall. If you were to talk to Isaac Newton, he wouldn't even have said that was a theory. It's still a hypothesis. And it's been a hypothesis for 50 years, hasn't it? Yes. Is it not me who's barking up the old tree, but actually is, is physics as a whole, have we come to a bit of a cul-de-sac? And do you think that maybe all the ingredients are there for something big? some really big change in our understanding that might suddenly make all these weird observations slot into place. Well, I certainly hope so. Um, mm. You know, you, you certainly haven't gone mad. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this, this mirrors a lot of the ways that, that, that I think as well. It's good to know I'm not bonkers. And I do have to thank Dr. Clark. We spent a good day chatting about all the past breakthroughs and how it often takes decades before some genius and their breakthrough is accepted. So it's entirely possible that out there somewhere is a genius with the answer and all we've got to do is find them. Okay, so 
Where will we begin our quest? Well, Mrs. Biscuit would suggest we begin the quest by tidying the office, but I say no, although I am gonna have to tidy it because incredibly, uh, we're gonna be zooming someone pretty important very soon. And I think just it's because of lockdown. I think these, the world's geniuses are sort of twiddling their thumbs a bit because of lockdown and they're agreeing to zoom idiots like me. Professor Donald Hoffman from California is a cognitive psychologist. Not the most obvious place to start our quest, but it turns out his specialist subject is how we humans see the universe. His experiments suggest that what we think we see isn't what's really there. So I'm looking for the next great big breakthrough in our understanding of the universe. And I believe you've discovered something really important. Yes. So most of my colleagues think that evolution shapes our senses to tell us truths about objective reality. The assumption is that animals who see the truth about their surroundings are better at hunting and better at avoiding being hunted. It sounds very, very plausible. Who could argue against that? But I decided to check it out. Professor Hoffman used some very powerful computers and a very powerful theory called evolutionary game theory to see if this assumption was correct. And we have a theorem. The, the theorem is, is quite the opposite of the intuitions. The, the theorem says the probability is zero that anything we see is the truth. That's what it entails. That's a stunning mm. result of the math. In other words, I'll put it really briefly. Mm. Seeing the truth will drive you extinct. That's what the theorem says. Seeing the truth will drive you extinct. Wow. If Professor Hoffman is right, then his results can potentially turn our understanding of the universe on its head. What's going on with that? What's Why? Yeah, th that's a great question. The, I think the best way to get the intuition is, suppose you have two people playing um, a, a race car game. One guy gets to just turn a wheel and see, you know, graphics of cars and so forth, the racetrack. The other guy has a, an electrode and he's inside the computer and he's toggling voltages as fast as he can to try to play the game. And, and the question is, which guy is going to win the game? The guy who can just turn his wheel and, and or the guy who's going to have to like toggle voltages. Good luck toggling voltages. So you're seeing the truth, but it won't help you play the game. So I was thinking the wrong way around then, because when you said the guy who's driving and he's seeing the seeing the road, he's not actually seeing what's real. That's right. You're saying the guy who's toggling the voltages is seeing what's That's real. That's right. That's right. Oh my god! And so these guys were seeing a a, a, a VR, a virtual VR. reality, and the reason is because it's easier to understand. The virtual world is easier. Is that right? It takes less time, less energy. It allows you to act more quickly. So, so just like the guy trying to toggle voltages to win the, the video game, he's seeing the truth, but it's just too slow and too complicated. So evolution has just wiped that away and says, you don't need to know all that. We have given you the simple, dumbed down user interface that hides the truth and just gives you a little eye candy that lets you play the game like the video game, driving the car and turning the steering wheel without seeing the reality that you are affecting reality and we're completely ignorant of what that reality is and how we're affecting it. Is your head hurting? Mine is. According to the good professor, everything we see is an illusion created in our virtual reality headset. Uh, as we're just getting my head around this a little bit, so the distance between my two fingers here doesn't have to be real at all. In fact, it probably isn't. You're saying that this distance could be a bit more like the Matrix or a bit like we're a virtual reality game. And the metaphor is these fingers are just pixels on a screen, a virtual reality screen. And what's really going on is a lot of ones and zeros in some processor somewhere. Exactly. That, that's right. Oh my gosh. Okay, this is big. because it means that everything we see and everything we know, including all of physics, is really just what's inside our virtual reality headset. We've got about as much clue as Neo did 
when he was stuck inside the Matrix as to what, what is outside of it. Truth is, it might be impossible for us ever to find out. You see, the thing is, our virtual headset may help us survive, but it also acts like a barrier stopping us from seeing what's really there. Think about it like this. If we were creatures in a computer game, then we'd be trapped in our virtual world. In this case, the computer screen. We'd never get to see the computer or the computer code that is responsible for lighting up the pixels. To find out what's really going on beyond the screen, we'd have to somehow travel past the pixels. So, and this is a long shot, for our quest to move forward, we're going to try and find a genius who might be looking past the pixels of our virtual reality headset. Where are we going to find them? Well, weirdly, it seems to me like quantum mechanics already has a pretty good definition of the size of the pixels in our virtual reality world. So I think we should look at quantum mechanics, you know, if we want to find out what's going on with these pixels. A hundred years ago, these guys came up with quantum mechanics. And today, most physicists believe everything, even space, is quantized. And I would argue that instead of the word quantized, you could say pixelated. So we need to find a scientist who's willing to go smaller than these pixels, which is 10 to the minus 35 meters, and find out what lies beyond. Problem is, almost every scientist thinks that's impossible. I did say almost. Two of the founding fathers weren't quite so sure. One was Schrodinger, and the other was Einstein. Einstein was convinced that something lurked beyond, and he wasn't convinced the other noggins had got the theory quite right. And a quick demo will show you why. So hold on to your noggin. Things are about to get very, very, very weird. Oh no, he's found me. Hey, Bunny. Do you mind helping me out as a sort of imaginary narrative device that'll help me explain something quite complicated? Uh, I can't get anyone else because of COVID. Um, well, you just wouldn't believe how busy I am at the just, moment. Just hear me out. So what we're going to do is we're going to replicate Einstein's dead, undead cat experiment. Einstein was originally going to use lots of explosives. But Schrodinger persuaded him to use a cat. If you want to try this at home, you'll need a radioactive source that every so often emits a single alpha particle. A detector which will trigger some poisonous gas which will kill a cat. Uh, that's great, but where are you going to get a cat from? I thought you could be the cat, Penny. Whoa, 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 Rory. Uh, no thank you, but a fantastic offer. OK, well, Bye, Rory. I guess I'll take the box and the carrot away. Oh, did you just say carrot? Yeah, the carrot's in the box. Well, let me just, I mean, I'll just have a little poke in and just, oh, that is a nice carrot to say the least. Hey! Now, common sense tells me that Bunny will either be alive or dead, depending on whether an alpha particle is emitted or not. If you ran But quantum mechanics has other ideas. Um, Bunny? Quick question, are you feeling alive or dead right now? Uh, well, I seem to have split into two. One of me is alive and the other one is, you know. That is exactly the quantum mechanical answer. In fact, Bunny is in a superposition of states right up until the observer looks inside. At that moment, God rolls his or her dice and Bunny's fate is sealed. Bunny. There are other interpretations of quantum mechanics. One popular one is that God, instead of rolling dice, creates a whole new parallel universe. So let us now go to parallel me in the parallel universe. Hello. Hello, parallel me. How are you doing? Yeah, good, thanks. Um, you're not quite as good looking in, in your universe as I am in mine, are you? You know, I was thinking exactly that. Really? That's weird. How's Bunny? Yes, Bunny is alive and happily munching on the carrot. How you doing, Bunny? 
Yep, no, this is a very mighty fine carrot. Now you're welcome to disagree with me if you like, but I happen to think that this version of quantum mechanics is also completely bonkers. Now what's really interesting is despite the fact that the world of quantum mechanics is blooming mad, physicists for the last hundred years have been really reticent to see if there's something beneath it that might give rise to all this craziness. And one reason could be that they believe there's no point, there's nothing you can see beneath quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is as small as you can get. It's like the pixels of our virtual reality. And what's the point in going beneath that? And of course, in this investigation, we, we, we do want to go beneath. We want to find out what's making those pixels light up. What is it really? What's really going on? And in fact, one guy I know of, Professor Gerard Tuft, who is a Nobel Prize winning physicist, father of the holographic principle, along with Suskin, a big, big heavyweight in the physics community. He has bucked the trend and he has said no to the no-go theorems that prevent you looking at looking beneath quantum mechanics. And he is taking a delve right now. And I wonder if he is somehow looking at the very code of the universe. Wouldn't it be great if we could talk to him? Benny, do you want to come and meet the great man? Yes, but I'm stuck in the box. Okay, I'll see you in a bit. No, no, no one likes an angry bunny, Rory. As I make my way down to the office, Rory. I wonder what an idiot like me can say to someone who is essentially the modern version of Einstein. Your hair's looking very good. It looks like you've been to the hairdresser. <laughs> I've still got to go. Okay, hold it there, hold it there, hold it there. Um, this is future me talking, and I've got an email through from Professor Gerard Tuft. Let me bring it up. Um, I said to him that I would send him a transcript of our interview so he could check he was happy with it. Dear Sir, the only positive result of this interview is the confirmation of why I am so reluctant to do oral interviews. There is no single sentence in this account that is reproduced correctly or is grammatically correct. Please delete this recording. G. Tuft. Hoo-ha! So I think it is a shock to have a nice hour-long chat and then for it to be cut down to a couple of minutes for anyone. So he's pulled out. However, I have to tell you, things that he said because they are really important for our quest. In order to explain quantum mechanics without relying on magic, Tuft has looked beneath the plant length and built up a model of what he thinks might be there. And I think what he's found is our first clue as to what lies beyond our virtual reality headset. These are cellular automata. A cellular automaton is a simple kind of computer. Each cell flips from black to white or stays the same according to a set of rules. And the rules only depend on the colors of the cells next to it. According to Tuft, the idea behind it is that nature is an information processing machine, much like a laptop. Only this laptop is as big as the universe. Tuft has given us a glimpse of what might be behind our VR headset, a kind of computer. And I think this is big. I'm talking about the next really big breakthrough in humanity's understanding of the universe. And to make sure I'm not barking up the wrong tree, I've made a loaf of bread which I'm going to give to Dr. Stuart Clark. In exchange for bread, I'm hoping Dr. Clark is going to give me his thoughts on the seemingly ridiculous idea that the universe is a kind of giant computer. Is the most fundamental thing in the universe not matter, not energy, so it's not particles mm. or photons or any of that. Is the most fundamental thing in the universe information hmm. and so if it is um and you can start thinking of the universe if you like as, as almost like a computer yeah. doing a big calculation 
So that somehow that couples to our physical reality, mm. you know, which which we perceive and make sense of, uh, and, and and our brains in some way create. And that that might be a really interesting way to look. Okay, I think we're on the right track. So now I'm going to look for a genius who maybe is thinking about the universe like Tuft as some kind of cellular automaton. Turns out that back in the 80s, people were thinking of the universe as some kind of computer and people were really into cellular automata. Oh, this is interesting. Stephen Wolfram. I think as a kid, I heard about Wolfram on Newsround. Wolfram, a Londoner, graduated from Oxford at age 17, received his doctorate in physics at Caltech at 20. I mean, if ever you were looking for a genius, this guy is it. Front cover of Nature, 1984. Look at all of that. This is obviously Wolfram got into cellular automaton. Wolfram discovered a particular rule for a one-dimensional cellular automaton called Rule 30, which, despite being super simple, reduced staggering complexity. This idea of simple things creating complex patterns reminds me of those fractals, which were also big back in the 80s. That's interesting. He makes a book called New Kind of Science. Okay, in the book, Wolfram predicts a way of creating the universe. In Wolfram's theory, the universe is a giant computer. This computer produces complexity through the repeated execution of simple rules. Now, I actually think that we should look at him a bit more because it links in so well with what Gerard Tuft is doing right now. So, time for a demo. Me, you and the pink one are going to, are going to try and explain how a set of simple rules might build the universe. And please don't ask why my fingers are blue. So here we are, the beginnings of the universe. The universe. Stephen Wolfram has simplified the cellular automaton, oops, cells, and replaced it with one of these. Stephen Wolfram would call it a node. And FYI, Mrs. Biscuit would call it a squash seed. Nodes can be connected. I'm gonna represent the connection with a lollipop stick. And from this moment on, all I'm gonna talk about are the connections. So we're now going to make a very simple rule and that simple rule is going to grow the whole entire universe. Okay. Wherever you see a connection on its own, you can add two more connections. And let's carry on, shall we? This isn't Wolfram's simple rule, by the way. It's just mine. Congratulations, a big triangle. Yes, I, I have made a big triangle. And as we go further, it turns out one rule is not enough because the connections start overlapping. Boom, look, I'm doubling up. So my second rule is whenever two connections double up on each other, you take them both away, leaving a little gap. Even with my super simple Astro Biscuit rules, we start to get interesting behaviours in the pattern. Firstly, many gaps form near the edge. Most of them get filled in, but importantly, not all. And the other is... I think you can see it's creating a grid. And what's this got to do with anything? Well, this massive lattice represents space. A million applications of the rule and my lollipop stick lattice would cover the earth. According to Wolfram, there are going to be trillions and 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 trillions of applications of rules every second. In one second, my lollipop stick lattice would be as big as the universe. Of course, this simple lattice just grows 2D space. The real rule would have to grow 3D space. Yeah, however, we've still got gaps in the lattice. What are they? Well, so some little knot or twist or missing bit from the lattice represents a particle. And what's interesting is that every time you apply a rule to one of these holes that we've got in this simple pattern, it moves the hole. It's like a particle that's moving. Of course, I've just got two rules and they're super simple. Add a couple more rules and the lattice might look like this. And iterate the rules a trillion or so times and you may end up with this. And maybe 
one of these patterns, our virtual headset is translating into the world around us. But that is a big maybe, because even if it was right, it would be almost impossible to prove. For instance, the trillions and trillions and trillions of iterations that go into making this bus would take a computer the size of our solar system years to compute. So how could we ever know if Wolfram had got it right? Well, there is another way. This is the amazing thing. According to Wolfram, the pattern that he's created is displaying the exact equations of relativity. Even in my super simple Astro Biscuit rules model of the universe, I think you can see how particles, i.e. gaps or twists or knots in the lattice, are going to warp the fabric of space. This warping of space mimics Einstein's theory of general relativity. Einstein said that large masses like planets also warp space. And if he's able to produce a pattern which gives us relativity and quantum mechanics and particles, and he's able to use the pattern that he's created to predict more stuff, well then that's a new theory. That is the new theory of everything. He's done it. So could a simple pattern created from what is essentially a piece of computer code, could it grow like some ginormous fractal and with a little bit of help from our virtual reality headset be transformed into the universe we see around us. Back in 2002, Wolfram had found Einstein's equations of relativity in the pattern, but quantum mechanics still eluded him. If he was right though, it was only a matter of time. But then the reviews of his book came in. A rare blend of monster raving egomania and utter batshit insanity. <laughs> wow. I mean, that is unusual. It looks like his book went down like worse than a lead balloon. For 18 years, the idea lay dormant. But then, two young theoretical physicists persuaded Wolfram to get back on it. And I've heard in the last year, they've made a tremendous breakthrough. So I'm on a little bit of a quest. We're searching for the code, the code that governs everything. And if you start getting quantum mechanics and general relativity and other sorts of stuff out of it, then you know you're probably pretty close. Now, is it possible that you found this code? That's a, that's a weighty question. Um, so, as you correctly said, it's like, you know, we're, we're looking for the machine code of the universe. Of the ones we've searched, I would be extremely surprised if one of them actually turned out to be our universe. Ah, oh dear. I thought they'd found the answer. But then Jonathan says something that is potentially even better. Okay, one of the remarkable things about this formalism is that, a, is that so much, so many of its features are generic. That, you know, you might think that things like relativity and quantum mechanics, you would, you know, they would be features that are peculiar to our particular universe and, and, and none of the others. But that's not what seems to be the case. What seems to be the case is that actually it's a very, very general property. Wow. So it's not that they haven't been able to find the code that produces both general relativity and quantum mechanics. It's that many of the codes they're trying all produce general relativity and quantum mechanics. The idea that you haven't found the actual code exactly, and yet we're creating this pattern, which I'm not going to pretend to understand, but there's a super complicated pattern. And if you look at it in a certain way, and we're allowed to look at it in any way we like, because who knows how the signals are coming into our head. We can do whatever we want with it. If you look at it in a certain way, the pattern tells us the story of relativity or quantum mechanics. It seems to be progressing in, in above and beyond anything else, really. It's not often you see things slotting into place in the way that they have been. And you know, this is the reason why we think we do have something interesting here. It all sounds amazing. And late one Friday night, Professor Stephen Wolfram himself agreed to give me a status update on his theory. Uh, I was kind of stuck on quantum mechanics. Mm, I'm very interested in this, actually. I've, I've always not been very happy with the whole dead cat thing. I had a 
friend uh, named Dick Feynman always used to say, nobody understands quantum mechanics. Yeah. And he, he and I would talk about this for ages. We are, I would say, as the weeks go by, I get closer to saying, I really understand quantum mechanics. Wow. Here's a, here's a really remarkable thing. My favorite fact so far from our whole development of physics. Physical space is one thing, but there's also this other kind of space that we call branchial space. And the story of quantum mechanics is a story of how things work in branchial space. Branchial space is a completely different way of describing the pattern. Remember my lattice and the particle moving around? Well, it turns out where I apply the rule has an effect on where the particle ends up. For instance, if I applied the rule here, the particle goes left. But I could have applied it here, in which case the particle would go right. We end up with two possible outcomes. And branchial space is a depiction of all these possibilities. And incredibly, this way of looking at the pattern describes quantum mechanics. So in physical space, you know, a straight line is deformed by the presence of, of mass. That's Einstein's equations. Mm -hmm. in, um, in branchial space, the exact same thing happens. Presence of, well, it's roughly the presence of energy it causes paths in branchial space to be deflected. So it's as if there's sort of a thing like gravity in branchial space that's associated with energy. And so what happens is, what is the Einstein equations in physical space, and it's talking about gravity, becomes quantum mechanics in branchial space. For me, this is really amazing because these have been two, you know, they're the two pillars of 20th century physics, and they've been things that have been very separate. And what we're realizing in this model, in this theory, is that they're actually the same thing. And so when you see them sort of weave together, which you do in certain cases around black holes and so on, that weaving together, which has seemed to be very difficult to do, because it seemed like we've got these two completely different theories, now they're actually facets of the exact same theory. And so they weave together really beautifully. Uniting quantum mechanics and general relativity like this has been something string theory has been trying to do for 50 years. Surely this is a fantastic sign, isn't it? I mean, the great yes. changes in the past, suddenly loads of other things have slotted into place, things that people weren't even thinking about. It's, boom, yes, that, oh, you know, you change your view of the universe and suddenly slot, slot, slot. And here you are. Yeah. It's really cool. It just seems so promising what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, look, I, I'm amazed too, because the fact is, you know, I, I keep on saying to, you know, Jonathan, who you've also talked to, you know, we, we figure out something and I keep on telling him it's never this easy. There are these moments when sort of some new idea comes about and there's a whole bunch of low hanging fruit to pick. And now is that moment. So could this be it? Have we found the final answer? Well, something that got me really excited was the fact that Professor Tuft the chap with the extremely good reputation is also looking at something like energy leading to quantum effects. Of course, it doesn't matter what I think, it's what the establishment thinks that matters. You know, in terms of the physics community, about 18 years ago, I, I published this big book called The New Kind of Science, which is kind of about this computational approach. And many communities were like, hey, this is really cool. The fundamental physics community, pretty much, even though, you know, I, I had been in their business, so to speak. It's not like I, I was, you know, I knew, I know these people. Mm -hmm. um, it's like there were, you know, it's kind of a parade of pitchforks, you know, this can't possibly be right. And it's like, please don't work on this. You know, if you're right, well, all the stuff we've done is wrong. 18 years ago, people still believed string theory would give us all the answers. We're almost there. We're going to get this. We don't need anybody telling us, you know, there's a new paradigm that's needed. But now it's clear string theory isn't the answer. And I think it's about time the establishment started looking at Wolfram's ideas. After all, his ever-growing pattern can do away with the need for dark energy, just like Einstein did away with the need for Vulcan. Thing is, most physics journalists claim that Wolfram's theory cannot make any testable predictions. But they are misinformed. Wolfram's models generically predict tiny particles far smaller than anything found in the establishment's current theories. He's called them oligons. Oligons, they're very, very tiny things. I'm assuming they're way out of reach 
the, I'm not sure they're so out of reach. No. I'm, I'm, I think that there may be some dark matter predictions from oligons that are, that are within reach. I think that the, the, you know, the effect of them in the early universe is, is almost certainly computable. The effect of them in, in uh, gravity wells and the existing universe is may be computable. I don't know. If the physics community hunts for oligons and finds them, then Wolfram's done it. And our universe will never be the same again. When I started working on this, I thought we're building this different direction about how physics might work. And all these things like string theory, they just have to be, you know, if I'm right, they're wrong, okay? But I don't think that's the way it is. I think what's true is that they are mathematical structures which actually show up as pieces of, of what we're doing. And what's really interesting, it seems that the things that are predictable exactly align with the big achievements of 20th century physics. The twist in the tale is that far from replacing quantum mechanics and relativity, Wolfram's universe couches these theories in a bed of computation. So we haven't swept away the universe that we know. What we've done is found that there's a lot more outside our virtual reality headset waiting to be discovered. Wow. So you might think I'd have been a bit nervous about chatting to someone approximately three million times more intelligent than me. However, uh, I do have to talk to Mrs. Biscuit most days and so I'm kind of used to it now. If you'd like to support my venture, please, there's a link to buy me a coffee or even for you to be my patron. Patrons get access to the full and mind-blowing Wolfram, Hoffman and Jonathan interviews. And of course, patrons are able to message me and ask me questions. I want to thank Richtenstein for doing a fantastic job on the music. Yes. Such a genius, link below. And he also did the mix and sound effects whilst wearing a VR headset. I want to thank uh, Professor Wolfram and Jonathan, of course, and the guys and girls who helped set up the Zoom. I want to thank uh, Dr. Stuart Clark, whose book, by the way, which I'll link to, uh, was part of the inspiration for doing this. It highlights all the things that are kind of messed up in the universe right now. Um, Professor Donald Hoffman, who also has a great book out. The Case Against Reality was shortlisted for the Physics World Book of the Year. And with Christmas coming, we're going to try and produce some bunny mugs. Also, maybe you want to get your loved one a telescope, which is what Mrs. Biscuit did five years ago, and she's been regressing it ever since. My website has lots of useful suggestions for revealing the universe to you without costing the Earth. Thank you for watching all the way through. Please subscribe. Doodle pops, take care. Bye.